Welcome committee members and members of the public to this May 10th, 2023 Governor's Workforce Development Board Executive Committee meeting. For the record, my name is Hugh Anderson, Chairman of the Governor's Workforce Development Board. Katie, will you take a roll call, uh, verify a, a quorum and verify posting? Sure, thanks. Okay, so we have Chair Anderson. Here. Vice Chair Evans. Present. Crystal Slaughter. Oh, Present. Present. Thank you. Uh, we have Lisa Levine, Jerry Merritt. She are on there. We have Councilman Black. Rob Benner. Here. And we have Jennifer Kaiser. All right, so we got five. So Mr. Chair, Katie Gilbertson, Governor's Office Workforce Innovation for the record. I hereby affirm that this May 10th, 2023 Governor's Workforce Development Board meeting has reached a quorum. I further affirm that the agenda and notice for this meeting were properly posted pursuant to Nevada's Open Meeting Law, NRS 241.020. Thank you very much, Katie. Continue on to uh, agenda item number four, public comments. Members of the public on remote technology are invited to provide comments at this time. No action may be taken on any matters during public comments until the matter itself has been included on an agenda as an item for possible action. Katie, do you see anybody on the telephone or Zoom? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. Very good. So moving on to agenda item number five, is there any discussion before I call for a motion to approve the March 15th, 2023 Executive Committee meeting, committee minutes, meeting minutes? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. So move uh, Vice Chair Evans. Thank you, Vice Chair. Do I hear a second? Rob Benner, second. Thank you, Rob. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Please let the record show that the motion carries. All right, moving on to agenda item number six for discussion and information only, the chair recognizes the executive director of Workforce Connections, Jaime Cruz, to give an update on industry sector partnerships. Welcome, Jaime. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the XCOM. If uh, somebody would put a, oh, thank you, Katie, here you go. Um, we have a quick update. As you remember last time, we gave you a more extensive update on what had happened in 2022. Uh, so now I'm just going to quickly update you on what's happened since our last meeting. So if we could go to the next slide, please. As you know, you can find more about the industry sectors uh, for Southern Nevada at workforceblueprint.org. There's plenty of information there about the validation study of how those seven target sectors were identified and also a lot about the 100 top in demand occupations on those sectors. Next slide, please. And of course, here's a reminder of uh, what those seven sectors are. Next slide, please. Uh, also a quick reminder that those industry sector partnerships that were launched in 2022 were based on the nationally uh, recognized model called the Next Generation Sector Partnerships or for short, Next Gen, which puts businesses at the center of this initiative and their voice. Next slide, please. And the quick update is uh, uh, that in this uh, short amount of 2023 that's transpired already, uh, by the end of this month, we will have reconvened all seven of those industry sector partnerships. And of course, the intent of those convenings is to identify opportunities for collective impact uh, for the entire industry and not necessarily for uh, one or two of the of the businesses that represent that industry. And by the uh, next meeting, we'll be able to bring you uh, more information about those opportunities for collective impact for the year 2023 that we will have extracted from those industry sector partnerships. Uh, in general, I think uh, one of our biggest objectives is to really make sure that all businesses are connected to the employee and B business hubs, which is the manifestation of our system uh, to how employers find resources at our American job centers. These employee and B business hubs, as you know, are a collaboration between the, our state 
agency, the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation and both local boards, convening other partners in our local areas as well, uh, being hosted at, at chambers, at cities, and uh, again, bringing in the Small Business Development or SBDC resources through UNLV and other partners, all to serve, again, businesses as best as possible in our local areas. Uh, a couple of examples of the resources available now at those business hubs is uh, thanks to our partners at the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation, a something that started as a half a million dollar incumbent worker training pilot. We call it an upskilling pilot because that's a lot of what the employer said they needed help with, upskilling their existing employees. Uh, Dieter has uh, signaled to us that they want to uh, expand that pilot from half a million uh, to 1.5, so increase it by another million dollars uh, as well. So we'll give you more details as that comes to fruition, but we're appreciative that Dieter is helping us respond to the needs of, uh, of businesses, what they're communicating to us that they need. The other big one is the recovery pilot, which is ARPA dollars from the city of Las Vegas. They decided to dedicate a million dollars to help businesses in their uh, city to be able again to do uh, not just incumbent worker training, but hiring incentives, training incentives, retention incentives to be able to help these small businesses recover and grow uh, post the economic effects of the pandemic. And then another uh, big focus for us is connecting these employers to the online platform that, can, that helps industry connect to the classroom. Right now we started through the K through 12 system. We want employers, we wanna to respond to the employer's request to really have connectivity in high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, and then we're gonna move on to post-secondary institutions after that. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, just to remind you that these uh, industry uh, sectors came out of the LVGEAs, our, our Regional Economic Development Agency Comprehensive Economic Development Plan, or SEDS. So those seven industry sectors, uh, we have now uh, assigned a mission to these uh, industry sector partnerships to serve those target industries. And that, that's just simply to align the local talent uh, development pipeline to effectively meet the needs of the region's target industry. So what is the, de what is the demand? What skill sets, for what occupations, for what industries? And we wanna make sure that we embed those needs as deeply as possible, not just in the colleges, university, post-secondary training institutions, apprenticeships, vocational training, all of that, but also into our high schools, our middle schools and elementary schools so that we give graduating seniors uh, as big as an opportunity or as many opportunities they have for choices in their career and to really help address this uh, talent shortage that employers are facing right now. You can see that we have three main goals. Number one is to increase engagement between industry and the talent development pipeline. And there's four strategies we're gonna use to do that. Next slide, please. The second goal of our industry sector partnerships is to connect employers to available workforce development resources. You've heard me in the last slide talk about those. There's four strategies we're gonna to use to effectively do that. And our third goal is to embed the industry needs in the talent development pipeline, just as you heard me say earlier. And there's a, uh, four strategies that we'll use to do that. So next slide, please. I'll be glad to answer any questions and go into more detail of those slides if you like, but I thought I'd keep it as short as possible, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Gilbertson. Have we been able to get Chair Anderson back in? Yeah, he's on his phone. We're trying to okay. figure out how to get him back on the computer. Okay, I'll, I'll try to help steer the ship uh, in his absence as best possible. Okay. When, let me ask, are there any questions? I have a few, but let me ask, are there, do any other members or anyone else in attendance have some questions for Mr. Cruz? And Mr. Vice Chair, th this is Jaime, obviously for the record, if, if anybody has a question of where I am, obviously I'm not in Las Vegas. I'm currently attending a conference in New Orleans with uh, many of my peers from across the nation. Uh, no, no problem. You getting the work done remotely. Okay, a uh, couple of questions uh, re related to your slides uh, and the information in them. First one is the 
particular effort with the incumbent workers, are we tracking the salary or the positions that people had before and after? And where I'm going with this is one of our concerns is making sure that as people come to our system, they end up in, first, they end up in positions, obviously, but beyond that, they end up in livable wage positions. So are we tracking their ascension, ideally, into livable wage positions and whether they stay or not? That's a great question, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate it. I think it will help us give color to the intent of the, uh, in this case, the incumbent worker training pilot that the Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation has funded. Uh, basically, uh, a couple of things. Number number one, uh, even though it's it follows very closely, we owe uh, uh, outcomes, if you will. Uh, so four things must happen for an employer to be able to uh, receive funding for, to train an employee of theirs. And number one, uh, our, one of our targets would be, of course, as you said, a wage gain. That would be if there's a wage gain that that qualifies and let's train that employee so they can move up the economic ladder, as you said. Uh, number two, sometimes it's a title change. So, you know, sometimes to get a wage change first, you have to get a, from a foreman, become a supervisor, assume some more responsibility before the responsibility, you need the skill set. And so, we acknowledge that sometimes there's some multi steps to get there. So a title change is another thing that will trigger eligibility for this worker. Promotion, another thing. So we have wage gain, title change, promotion. And the fourth one is layoff aversion. We don't want anybody to lose their job when there's new technology needed to keep up with the workplace. Sometimes employers bring in new systems and employees, if not upskilled, become obsolete. And so layoff aversion is another reason to, uh, to uh, fund an incumbent worker training. Uh, the other part of the question also is important that, that Dieter has asked us to track these employees for a year, because we wanna make sure again that these investments, if we're gonna keep doing, incumbent worker training hasn't been something that we've been traditionally funding in Nevada, and there's many reasons for that. And so in order for us to consider, for the state to consider funding it in the future, they do want to look at the sustainability of that investment. So we will track for a year, to make sure that those employees are still there. And as you said, Mr. Vice Chair, at what salary range? Okay, thank you very much. And then my quick follow-up, and uh, this is a parking lot, uh, Ms. Gilbertson, is there a way we can tie their tracking into our Empower system? Because I know we're trying to get to the point where we have a long, I'm gonna call it a longitudinal data management system so that we can track things like what I just asked you about, Mr. Cruz. So even if we got to put it in the parking lot, Ms. Gilbertson, is there a way to use this as a test case or a test opportunity for getting data into that system? Yeah, Katie Gilbertson, for the record, I know um, Kristen, our Empower Data Manager at Golan, has been trying to get this data in there, um, pretty much any data you can, right? So I think the, the, the industry sector partnership data would be a good good integration of it. And we can definitely talk more about that, how that works down the line. But, Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Vice Chair, I also see David and Carlene from Dieter on the call. They might be able to chime in and verify or validate that if uh, if that data is required or needed for you know integration to other systems, perhaps employee NB uh, .gov, the, the, the uh, MIS or management information system of record for the state and these kinds of things might be a solution. So I'll pause there and I'll just to make sure I'm not on the right, on the wrong page. So Carlene and David, I know that, um, it, would that be something that is uh, an, a viable solution? This is Carlene. So Jaime, because it's a pilot project, unless it's a current vendor that's allowed to use the product, we're not gonna be able to screen it through Employee NV. This would be like one of the pilot projects that we would do with Gov Reserve money, that we just get something on a piece of paper. But this is why it's so important that we co-enroll those either with Title I or Title III, because then Title I and Title III information goes into empower as part of our agreement. So it's a matter of getting our staff members to agree to 
cross pollinate as we like to call it so that we can get the data into the system. Okay, if I may, because I promised to put it in the parking lot as Vice Chair Evans for the record. That's the reason why I'm asking this question is to anticipate things like this. I know enough to be dangerous, like what is it, uh, uh, application, API interface. I, I can't remember what the P, but the bottom line is we've got to get to the point where we start making all these systems talk to each other for the ultimate benefit of the two sets of clients we have, the prospective candidates as well as the employers. Okay, the second thing that I wanted to ask real quick so we can keep moving, Mr. Cruz, is uh, is there a way to make sure that you interact with our barriers and underserved populations uh, subcommittee, uh, in particular that last slide where you talked about the talent development pipeline and starting it in middle school, elementary school. So again, this can go in the parking lot, but for further action, et cetera, is there a way that we can interact with the uh, barriers and underserved populations subcommittee? Yeah, the short answer would be yes, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks. Chair, Chair Anderson, are you in a position to keep going or do you want me to keep steering the ship? I'm, uh, I'm back on the line, my friend. Thank you. Uh, apparently, Zach didn't want my participation, so he hammered me out the door. And then my, my computer crashed trying to get back in. So I'm back on the telephone anyway. Okay, I'm ready to turn it over for the next uh, ISP briefing by the other end of vigil, I think. That sounds good. So can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're moving on to agenda item number seven for discussion and information only. The chair recognizes strategic projects director for Nevada Works, Parvane Carter, to give an update on industry sector partnerships. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the record, I'm Parvana Carter with Nevada Works. Um, I am presenting today in Milt's place. He apologizes that he wasn't able to attend today. Um, as um, Jaime discussed, uh, Nevada Works is also rolling out um, sector partnerships through our Good Jobs Northern Nevada grant. We're rolling those out in the four sectors of IT, logistics, manufacturing, and healthcare. And we're using that next generation industry sector model for that. Um, in that process, we have held 13 employer roundtable meetings across our local area to ensure participation and input throughout our large and diverse regions. Um, meetings were held in Reno, Carson City, Lovelock, and Elko. The labor market information and in-demand occupation data consisting of both statewide and regional um, data was presented for each sector at those roundtables. Um, there was a robust discussion um, where feedback was received from the employers about their most critical talent needs, most important soft skills and technical requirements, the desired credentials for those positions, and their average salary offerings for those positions of need. There was a total of 126 attendees represented by 76 different employers. There was a total of 28 employer commitments to interview and are to hire participants who successfully completed training. We're anticipating a significant jump in commitments to hire after the second round of employer input sessions, and those are being held in June and July of this year. Um, we also um, have a tribal partnership subplan. Um, a meeting was held with the Inner Tribal Council of Nevada's Executive Director and Workforce Development Coordinator, where the collaborative effort to engage tribal governments, their enterprises, and Native-owned businesses was solidified. The Good Jobs Northern Nevada Tribal Navigator Thurman Roberts has engaged with 21 tribes across 13 county service areas. He's also represented Nevada Works Good Jobs Northern Nevada to six separate tribal council meetings with an overwhelming support from the tribal elders and council chairs. Thurman and Dr. Alexander Wright from Westhead have begun a series of eight tribal community input sessions across Nevada Works' local area um, over a three-week period to gather further information on tribal workforce needs. Thurman and Alex um, have created a tribal workforce development committee, which Thurman will serve on along with the UNR tribal liaison, Balan Paiute Shoshone Taro Administrator and Pyramid Lake Workforce Development Coordinator. 
These founding members will continue to recruit additional members from the tribes as they continue the community input sessions. Um, so that's kind of what's been going on with us in the industry sector partnership. And we are also participating in the incumbent worker training pilot program with Dieter. And um, we're working with businesses to get cohorts into that program. And I'm available for questions uh, if you have any. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Carter? Uh, yes, uh, Chair Anderson. Vice Chair Evans here. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Carter, a uh, similar question that I had for Mr. Cruz uh, in that you, what I'm interested in in is the jobs that you're placing people or, you know, management level positions. I'm sorry, you um, froze and cut out, so I didn't catch the question. I apologize. Okay, let, let me try again. A similar question to Mr. Cruz. Are the positions that are available, are they all entry level? Or are some of the positions mid-level or possibly even management or senior level positions? For the Good Jobs Northern Nevada grant yes. or the incumbent worker? Um, the incumbent, the incumbent worker, but then I'm also, I'm interested across the board, but definitely for the incumbent work. Um, the incumbent worker training, um, I believe that it's open to any person that would want to be able to upskill and, you know, continue the trajectory of their career pathway. So if they're looking to upskill into a management position, and the um, company is open to providing that position to them after they receive the training, then they would be able to move up into that position. And then for the good jobs effort, as well as the resource fair that you had, where the comp the employer, I think you said 76 employers made commitments, were they commitments for entry level positions only or were, for, were some of them for mid-level to higher level positions as well? Um, there was a total of 28 employer commitments. We had um, 76 different employers present at those meetings. Um, I don't have an answer for you around the sorts of positions that they're um, committed to. I know that they're working on creating um, upskilling and training pathways to different positions within those industries. Um, through my discussions, I know that it's open from entry level up the, the chain, um, but if you would like more of a specific question as to what those positions are, I can provide you with the list after this when I um, meet with Nancy Rowe to find that answer out. She's the director of that grant and that program. Okay, final thing for the record for both Mr. Cruz and Ms. Carter. Yes, that's, that's gonna be an ongoing theme is bringing people in, not just at entry level, but for some of the mid-level to higher level positions as well, as well as keeping monitoring that as well, because it obviously ties to the livable wage aspect to what we're trying to accomplish as well. Thank you. Yes, the good jobs, uh, no, I'm sorry to apologize, um, Parvana Carter for the record again. Um, the good jobs Northern Nevada does have a requirement for them to have a livable wage as well as benefits. So whether it's an entry level or moving up, that's part of the parameters of the grant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ken. Ms. Carter, this is Hugh Anderson. I have a question and you have to forgive me. Uh, I was uh, wrestling with the technology while uh, Mr. Cruz was speaking. Are, is Nevada Works and Workforce Connections ex exchanging intelligence uh, from feedback they're getting from their industry sector council participants, e recognizing that there are geographical differences in need, but uh, are you uh, exchanging what intel you're getting so we can make sure that these uh, industry sector councils are uh, continue to be uh, viable outlets for uh, these employers to make sure uh, we know their needs? Uh, Parvana Carter, for the record, my understanding is that Jaime and Milt are in constant contact with another and sharing and um, exchanging information, but I'll let Jaime answer that in further detail. Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. So um, through you, Mr. Chair, the short answer is yes, uh, we are significantly ahead. Of course, we have a year uh, you know, of activities already 
Um, and seven established sectors with many initiatives in place, as, as you have heard over the last two updates. Um, Nevada Works is just beginning now because the, the, the timing of the grant. And so despite that, as uh, mentioned, we have been in, in, and continue to be uh, committed to being in close communication so that the information that comes out of both regions uh, can serve as intelligence for this uh, state board. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Carter? And remember, I can't see all the little flashy boxes, so I don't know if anybody has a question, but if I... Hearing none or seeing none, moving on to agenda item number eight. Oh, and thank you, Ms. Carter, for the update. We appreciate thank it. You. Uh, moving on to number eight for discussion and information only, the chair recognizes strategic planning subcommittee chair Nancy Olson, business process analyst two at Nevada Department of Education Ariana Flores, Florence, excuse me, and Dieter Chief Economist David Schmidt to present an update on the strategic planning subcommittee and state plan. Who'd like to kick it off, Nancy? Uh, yeah, this is Nancy Olson, and I will kick it off. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, Nancy Olson. And um, what I'm basically going to do is uh, turn this over to David Schmidt. We had um, a, kind of a, an update from David in the last work group meeting to um, get a kind of a preview, an, an early glimpse of the um, economic outlook that would be included probably in the state plan and therefore the state plan should um, you know any any priorities any strate any strategies should be around that economic outlook so we wanted to get um, an update of that from Dave Schmidt and then go from there as far as the priorities and the strategies within the state plan. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Schmidt to uh, fill you in on that. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, Dave. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the uh, uh, executive committee. Uh, for the record, uh, David Schmidt, Chief Economist for the uh, Nevada Department of Employment Training and Rehabilitation Research and Analysis Bureau. Um, and as, as Nancy said, uh, my, my goal in, in providing this short update is to try to uh, pull forward in time a little bit the uh, some of the economic analysis, especially those things that are uh, likely to still be true uh, when uh, we're writing the the final analysis for the uh, the upcoming state plan, uh, so that there's more opportunity to respond to the 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 uh, trends and and what uh, at least we're seeing in uh, Nevada's uh, labor markets. Uh, some of the, the the really quick highlights there uh, are uh, employment uh, has been increasing uh, and it's uh, over the last several months been growing at or near the the fastest pace in the country. Uh, we'll probably be more than 100,000 jobs higher uh, than we were prior to the pandemic. Uh, by the time the state plan is being written, currently we're at 97,000, and I expect to see more growth there before the uh, we get to the end of the, the fiscal year. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of growth, uh, in particular in the transportation, warehousing, utilities industry. Uh, the accommodation industry is the one that's lagging the, the furthest behind. Uh, generally speaking, this growth is taking place across uh, most industries in the state. Uh, at the same time, uh, Nevada's also had the highest unemployment rate in the country, uh, which is somewhat difficult to explain sometimes. It's been by a pretty significant margin, close to one full percentage point. Um, the, the emphasis there is that we are seeing gains in both employment and unemployment. Uh, and so we're not necessarily seeing people losing jobs and becoming unemployed or rather people coming from being outside the labor force into the labor force. Uh, and as those people are coming in, uh, most of them are finding work. Uh, some of them are uh, unemployed. Uh, overall, the labor market is very tight. Uh, we have uh, more job openings than total unemployed people, uh, which means that there, there is uh, a lot of demand for labor that's out there. Uh, we'll probably uh, go into this a little bit more when we get to the full state plan, but it, it, it is an environment where employers are 
um, working hard to try to find workers. Uh, we also see this in uh, separations. Uh, nearly uh, three out of four job separations that are taking place uh, each month are taking place in the form of quits, not in the not in uh, layoffs or discharges. And so it is uh, individuals who are uh, voluntarily leaving work instead of being separated from work uh, to a, a pretty high degree. We the, this data goes back to about the year. Uh, 2000 and both in Nevada and the U.S. This is the highest level of quits as the share of total separations that we've seen. Uh, and so workers generally have a pretty uh, high level of, of power in their job search compared to uh, what would normally be the case in the state. Uh, there are some headwinds on the horizon that, that may uh, become more apparent uh, as we go through uh, the next few months before we get to the state plan. Uh, Federal Reserve is continuing to raise interest rates uh, to try to bring down inflation, uh, even if uh, it uh, could trigger a recession. Uh, depending on who you ask, will there will there be a recession is a, a hard question, but it is something that's sort of in the air as uh, trying to make sure that inflation remains in check. Uh, this could particularly impact uh, some uh, like the housing market. Uh, we've seen mortgage rates go uh, much higher. Uh, you could see some impacts on our construction and finance industry, uh, though I say all of that with the very large caveat that I do not expect anything like the Great Recession. If you say higher mortgage rates on housing industry, we might think that that's going to be a re repeat of the, the Great Recession. That's not currently my uh, expectation, in part because we haven't had the boom in the construction industry that we saw in the lead up to that. Uh, to the Great Recession, we have been growing uh, but we're growing more steadily, and we still aren't at the level of construction employment that we were uh, in, in the housing boom. So I, I think there's less uh, overweight growth uh, in that area, and so there's less potential impact from those jobs going away. A big part of the Great Recession for Nevada was going from 150,000 to 50,000 construction jobs uh, over the course of that downturn and losing two-thirds of a really high-paid uh, industry uh, in parts of our state. Uh, we are expecting employment uh, growth to slow down uh, in the employment projections that I provided uh, to staff who, uh, who were uh, presenting to the, the economic forum. Uh, my, my projections were that we would be seeing growth come down closer to uh, one to 2%. Uh, currently we're running at about uh, four and a half to 5% over the year in terms of employment growth as we're still sort of seeing some of the, uh, the, the growth uh, and the pent up demand that we saw coming out of the pandemic. Uh, longer term growth rates should probably slow down closer to something uh, like our overall population growth rate. Uh, at some point, you, you stop bringing additional people out of the woodwork and your, your growth is sort of limited by how fast your overall population is growing. Uh, and so we are expecting a, a bit of a slowdown there, but still uh, looking for, for growth in the longer term. Uh, one of the interesting things that I think will uh, be worth thinking about, particularly from a strategic point of view, is the, the age of the workforce. Uh, for the last uh, couple of decades, one of the dominant trends has been the aging of the baby boom generation and now the retiring of the baby boom generation. But by 2030, it's really interesting to me that of the, uh, if you group the population by age, none of the top 10 five-year age buckets uh, will be people over the age of 50. The top six uh, will all be uh, working age uh, individuals. And so as we see uh, the millennial generation and Gen Z aging more into the workforce, we're seeing this shift away from the labor market dynamics being driven by what's happening with the baby boom generation to actually having a much larger concentration at relatively young ages. Um, the millennials are entering right the, the, the center of their prime working years right around age 40. Uh, and you're, you're seeing Gen Z start to move into the workforce. And I think this is a, going to be an important trend over the next several years is how does the labor market react to this transition from having an older and retiring generation to a much larger incoming younger generation. Uh, and finally, uh, automation and AI is one of those things that is on the tip of everybody's tongues. I don't know that anyone knows exactly how it will impact things, but I think part of the uh, importance here relative to things like uh, automation or shifts in productivity and uh, prior years is that this could have a larger impact on professional uh, types of work uh, and or creative types of work that weren't necessarily as exposed to uh, earlier uh, methods of automation. Uh, and I, I think that could have some potential, but 
known impacts on uh, where we should look for shifts in the workforce. Uh, the, the last two points uh, in the, the bullets that I sent out look at uh, affected populations. I've also been uh, presenting uh, recently to the Barriers and Underserved Populations Subcommittee uh, and pulled in the, the presentation that I, I gave to them to our last working group meeting to make sure that we're talking about the same population so that on the one hand, as we look for who uh, might be targeted, making sure that that information is coming over on the strategic planning side so that uh, both of these subcommittees are talking about that. Uh, in particular, some of the, the groups that I, I talked about were uh, uh, young Black men, uh, women with children and single parents, and then individuals with disabilities, uh, as well as incorporating our report on uh, demographics uh, for uh, groups that have high unemployment uh, pursuant to a statute that we uh, report on that information and make sure that it's uh, available to the board. Uh, and that, that's kind of my bullet pointed, what do I think some of the highlights in the, the economic uh, and labor market analysis portion uh, of the state plan will be in a few months. Thank you, David. Ariana, did you want to add anything? She may have stepped away. <laughs> okay. So, Nancy. David, uh, I. Thank you, Nancy. I have a question, uh, David. Uh, considering that uh, Nevada draws a lot of already retired boomers to, as residents uh, over time, uh, do you have any sense of the um, demographic profile of Nevada's labor force as compared to the national averages? Are we Do we skew younger by and large, average or above average in age? Uh, David Schmigan, for the record, uh, Overall age of the labor force, I would I would have to take a look at it. it. It would not be hard to pull that information. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Uh, we have been seeing a somewhat lower labor force participation rate, and so the the share of our population that's engaging with the workforce is a bit lower than the national average. And I think that that's the the primary cause that we do have this larger share of people uh, moving here, uh, that are unlikely to be working. They are, they are not working and they're very happy, uh, to not be working. Uh, and, and we, we can say that, uh, over the last, uh, couple of decades, we have definitely seen a larger increase in our, uh, population for people who are not in the labor force and do not want a job. Uh, we, we've recently been breaking out some shares of uh, people who are not in the labor force, but are engaged in some form of work. They, they say that they want a job. They may have searched in the past year and they may even be available for work, uh, but there are some other barriers that are preventing them from looking in the last four weeks or being uh, currently available for work. Um, Thank that, you. That, that is a very important uh, driver of, uh, you know, some, some of the challenges relative to the population uh, that we might face. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for uh, Dave or Nancy? Yes, Chair Anderson, uh, Vice Chair Evans here. Uh, real quick, uh, uh, David, you mentioned early in your presentation that right now there's mo there's there's numerous openings. I guess my question would be is, is there a way to figure out how many of those openings are actually listed or publicized in our workforce development system? And the follow-up question is, for the individuals that are looking but may have barriers, is there a way to get a handle on them so that we can figure out where the disconnects are with our system as we move forward? Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Vice Chair and David Schmidt again for the record. Um, when when talked about total job openings in the state, it, it is important to probably caveat this comes from a uh, uh, a survey. Uh, and so it, it is an, an estimate. It's not a count of here are the 118,000 job openings and, and who has them. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, sources. Uh, we, we can uh, look at uh, job openings that are posted uh, through Employee B. Uh, for uh, instance, we can count those and we can look at what they are and who they are and how many of them there are. Uh, we also get uh, information through the National Labor Exchange, uh, through a, a researcher back end where we can look at the the number of jobs that are, are posted in that system, which I, I believe has pretty high overlap. It, it, there may be some differences, but 
Uh, th those are the two sources that, that we could use to see how many job openings there are right now. The, the two are pretty different. Uh, and information about job openings is uh, something that, that's been a bit of a question for probably the last five or six years because there has been a steady increase in job openings. Some people uh, critique the data. Uh, saying that uh, because it's easy for employers to say post a job opening, even if they don't have any intention of hiring it, uh, if, if it's no cost to do that, some employers may be doing that to uh, look as though they're growing and expanding. It's more of a projection of that what that employer wants the public to see than it is an actual intention to hire. So they might uh, report job openings that aren't necessarily really real. Um, so that, that is a potential with the data. I don't think that's anything unique to us, but it's you know, as we try to work with uh, open data in, in the world out there. And so we could compare the survey estimate of job openings to the total number of job postings that we have, uh, but I, I would only want to do so carefully and with a, a pretty big asterisk by it. And, and actually, Mr. Smith, here's what I'm ultimately trying to get to is I'm trying to figure out, are people using our system or not? And if they're not using it, let's get to the root cause of what we need to do to get them to use the system. Um, and I, just, I, you can put that in the parking lot for now because yeah. I don't want to belabor the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Any and other questions? Second, this, and I'm sorry, Chair Anderson. And then the second half of what I was asking is, once again, I know, I think the number was 40 or 42,000 young people that are out there that are un or underemployed. Do we have statistics on how we're doing about connecting with them and getting them to use the system? Um, uh, David Schmidt again, for the record, off the top of my head, um, I, I think that's a, that is a comparison that we could look at to see like how many people are are registered and compare those those registrations to our estimates of unemployment. Uh, so that, that that is another angle that we could go and data that we could at least include in the uh, the state plan. And and once uh, again, we, yeah, one can have can have for the record. Once again, we can put that in the parking lot. What I'm driving at here is for that particular population that's already challenged in terms of access and awareness, are we doing what we need to do in a proactive manner? And we won't know that if we don't ask them and follow up. Thank you, Chair Anderson, for your indulgence. Thank you, Ken. Any other questions? Katie, or my eyes, tell me if anybody has a question. I don't see any questions. Um, I, I saw Ariana just came back on. I don't know if she was off or not, um, but I can kind of give a little bit of an update as to what we're going to do with that data um, that, that David presented with the state plan, because um, he presented to the work group the data, and he always, and he presented to the barriers and underserved populations subcommittee of the data. So what we're trying to do is, you know, make this all combined and unified group for our state plan. Um, and an approach that we have been talking about was potentially using the populations that we're identifying through the data, trying to match them to um, programs that exist, sort of like an asset map. Uh, and I, and I don't wanna steal anybody's thunder for the next update, but trying to see which individuals we need to serve, identify which programs are there. And if there's not, if they're not there, figure out the gaps in the workforce system and try and write about that in the state plan of what we can do better. Um, so I, I think this is all talking together, um, just from what I've seen, you know, I go to all, all these meetings. <laughs> so, and I, and I think this is kind of the direction of the state plan for making it more unified and cohesive and a strategic document. Thank you. Any questions for Ariana? Okay, hearing none. Thank you all for your input. We appreciate it. Uh, moving on to agenda item number nine for discussion and information only. The chair recognizes Governor's Workforce Development Board Vice Chair Ken Evans and Barriers and Underserved Populations Subcommittee Vice Chair Dr. Tiffany Tyler Garner to present an update on the Barriers and Underserved Populations Subcommittee. Thank you very much, Chair Anderson. Uh, I'll kick it off and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tyler Garner uh, 
to uh, provide the bulk of the uh, feedback. Uh, very quickly, uh, it's a personal note, but I've been very open about my situation. Some of you may be aware. I was unable to attend the last series of meetings because I was uh, addressing an ongoing medical condition that I have. I've been pretty public. I've got early stage prostate cancer. So went through some recent uh, medical appointments. And the bottom line is, in summary, things are still early stage. I'm evaluating treatment, but a very good prognosis moving forward. So for the people that are already aware or partially aware, I just wanted to put that out there to you know, make sure people know that. Having said that, uh, want to make sure that we continue to pick up the pace. So I want to say thank you very much to uh, Ms. Levine and Ms. Gilbertson, as well as uh, newly minted Vice Chair Tyler Garner for stepping in to keep things going because we do want progress to continue. So having said that, there was a recent meeting with the underserved uh, and barriers subcommittee so that we could have a discussion. Uh, thankfully, the city of Las Vegas wants to engage in this because uh, I venture to say a significant potential part of the population is within the city of Las Vegas jurisdiction. So I want to say thank you to uh, Dr. Tyler Garner for being willing in more ways than one to come on board. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to her to give us a synopsis of what was discussed with the understanding that what I anticipate happening is we're going to come out of this update and the last meeting and follow up on some uh, action items. So with that, Dr. Tyler Garner, I'll turn it over to you for a summary. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Vice Chair and Chair, for the opportunity to provide a brief overview of the last convening. I'm, I'm pleased to note a few key items uh, occurred during that meeting. One was a substantive report from Chief Economist David Schmidt, where we determined or found that there were several segments of the population experiencing disproportionately high unemployment. In the case of some segments, and I would ask uh, Chief Schiff to uh, share as well, that depressionary level highs of unemployment at a time where uh, the employment was about 3.5% for everyone else. As a part of that discussion, we began uh, considering uh, in our role as a committee, how might we uh, effectively impact those concerns? And a few uh, next steps are under consideration. Uh, one, an asset mapping process, where we believe that there've been some previous efforts to do so. And so we wanna build on those and update it to see what kinds of initiatives or efforts are already underway. One that was highlighted was work happening uh, within a particular municipality, the city of Las Vegas. We're in a five mile radius over the next 40, uh, 24 to 48 months. There will be um, training centers, workforce housing, uh, small business support co-located within a five mile radius in a particular community that has experienced disproportionately high unemployment. Also the need to conduct a gap analysis to determine what resources are being leveraged. So some of the very timely questions that uh, happening at the top of this call, particularly our vice chair who inquired, kind of do we have a sense of the correlation between upskilling and uh, what the median wage is and if it's livable employment. Also the extent to which folks are actually leveraging the public workforce system to establish career pathways are questions that are top of mind for the committee as we think about what the particular barriers are and what strategies may be employed to uh, mitigate the um, rather pervasive, persistent unemployment happening in some uh, segments of the community. And then beyond that, to partner with you and others to determine how might we better braid resources so that we collectively create on-ramps to opportunity for uh, communities. And so excited about uh, the discussion and work underway and entertaining any questions you may have about um, some of the key findings of our, uh, of, from the discussion. Vice Chair. Well, this is, this is Hugh Anderson. Uh, 
Dr. Uh, Tyler Garner, um, first of all, thank you for being willing to step up and participate in this incredibly important initiative. Uh, your, your experience and, and worldview is going to be very, very vital to the success of us making a difference in this agenda, so thank you for that. Uh, from first blush, what you heard in that first meeting, what give us one or two data points that, that stand out to you, because you, you made a, a, a mention a minute ago that uh, certain segments of the population are experiencing a, a dis depression era level uh, levels of unemployment, uh, which is, you know, heartbreaking to say the least. What else did you hear that uh, needs uh, our immediate attention and, and focus? Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, one concern was that uh, in terms of the young black men that Chief Economist Smith noted earlier that the unemployment rate was is 29% in a time when it's only 3.5% anywhere else. So if you can imagine almost like a ninefold uh, increase just among that population. And in fact, that historically, it has been anywhere from three to five times greater than the general population. That is concerning, particularly as we think about how we talk about the market that we're in, where we're saying employers are looking for folks consistently. And uh, if we take into consideration, there's typically a percentage of underreporting because these are folks that are likely have some touch point with the system. That's why we're able to indicate uh, their employment status. It suggests that the number may be even greater. And so if you can imagine that, uh, I think it, during the depression, as well as maybe the month that the pandemic ensued, we had a 30% unemployment rate in the state. So at a time where we have rebounded, still have one of the highest unemployment rates uh, at 3.5 or 6% or so, these individuals are experiencing it at nearly 30%. So like in conditions where their unemployment feels like what it did during the Great Depression. That's, that's uh, an opportunity. And it certainly is. Effects. And then beyond Thank that, you. Uh, women with children and individuals with special needs begs the question about what are the opportunities to partner there. We looked at a particular site where we found that um, in the community where we're co-locating resources, that there were several projects underway specifically to have women with children as a, a target. So what is the opportunity to maybe look at some two generational approaches so that we can interrupt the cycle and begin a uh, for one generation and maybe begin a new trajectory for those that accompany them as a part of that process. And then of course, as we consider uh, individuals with special needs, uh, some of the questions that uh, that uh, are particularly pertinent is how we are leveraging institutions like vocational rehabilitation to change the trajectory there, recognizing that it has uh, historically been disproportionately higher. And so I would ask if Chief uh, Economist Schmidt, are there other things you would add specifically about the reporting or um, targets or findings that we uh, noted during that convening? Uh, David Schmidt, again, for the record, I, I think you hit the highlights. Uh, the, the number that stood out to me the most was that uh, roughly 29% uh, unemployment rate uh, specifically for uh, black men under the age of uh, 24. Uh, uh, and, and then individuals with disabilities have high rates of unemployment. Uh, and then for uh, women with children, uh, it, it was less, of, the story was less about unemployment than it was uh, labor force participation. And so the, the barriers that prevent people even for, from looking uh, for work, uh, as opposed to necessarily you know, the, the job search process itself. And so it, that, that was a, a little bit more of a, an onboarding type of thing. So I think those, those are the highlights. Thank you, Chief Congressman Schmidt. So even as we considered uh, women with children and single parents and the disproportionate unemployment that may be present there, I was encouraged by the fact that this committee had already been looking at some of the factors which include childcare and childcare affordability. And so on the path and asking questions about what are, what's the one next right step that we can take collectively to move the needle and what might be some subsequent steps, partners or initiatives that could be leveraged to help us gain momentum. Thank you. 
Any other questions for Vice Chair Evans or Dr. Tyler Garner? Uh, Chair Anderson? Yes, sir. Yeah, just very quickly, I want to say once again, thank you very much to uh, Dr. Tyler Garner, and I look forward to working with you as the Vice Chair. Uh, it, it's going to be helpful to have you aboard to keep things moving. Uh, while alarming uh, the number for African American males, I'm glad we're putting this on the record, and now we need to put some action and initiative and things on the record as well, which I'm sure we will. That's the reason why we're asking the questions that we are and, and, and trying to encourage people to collaborate to address this. W one thing that comes to mind, Kate, uh, Ms. Gilbertson, I'm wondering if it would be helpful for us to publicize what we're finding beyond just this board, meaning is do we need to put this in the papers or the news or whatever? Because from my vantage point, what we don't want to have happen, and I'm going to put this out there for people to consider looking at. If you're not already familiar with the Kerner Commission report, I would encourage you to look at the Kerner Commission report because in the late 60s, there were economic conditions and unemployment conditions that led to, um, well, I'll just go ahead and say it. It led to riots and things that I'm not saying we're moving in that direction, but what I will say is this. I think we've already made ourselves a promise that we don't want to see the region recover and disproportionately leave people behind because that could lead to friction and frustrations that could result in some counterproductive behavior. So again, I would encourage people to take a look at the current commission report and let's make sure that we're addressing disparities like this as well as publicizing them. So when we go to certain people, they'll be a bit more hopefully empathetic and responsive as opposed to pushing back when maybe we wanna do some innovative things or disruptive things to the system as it is now. Thank you, Chair Anderson, once again, for allowing me to share. Thank you, Ken. And uh, Hugh Anderson, for the record, uh, do not under downplay uh, that cycle of inequality. Uh, things run in cycles, and it's been roughly 50 years. And the fact that we had zero interest rates that created an enormous income inequality and asset inequality in this country, uh, there are lots of indicators all over the world uh, talking about social unrest that if we don't if we don't start addressing it and making it clear that we are looking to address it, uh, we could have problems. So I think you're absolutely right, Ken. All right. If there's no other questions on that item, I'll give it a minute. All right. Moving on to agenda item number 10 for discussion and information only. The chair would like to hear feedback from the executive committee members based on the information heard today regarding the state plan or any other items you'd like to address. Mr. Chair, Crystal Slaughter for the yes. um, yes, I Crystal. just wanted to make a statement. I sit on the, the underserved um, committee as well. And uh, Dr. Tiffany um, Tyler Gardner brought, Gardner, I'm sorry, um, brought a wealth of information and really opened our eyes um, at that meeting. And I really, really look forward to working with her, um, you know, in the future and, and on these projects with her. Um, it is an alarming, uh, alarming rate. Um, and I've said before, you know, we get all these reports, but I wanna know mm. how do we, you know, hit the ground and start addressing them? How do we start reaching them? Um, you know, those are the things that I'm really interested that I can source out to um, my, you know, counterparts and people, um, you know, that have job openings and, and you know, union training centers that um, need, um, you know, more people like this. So, you know, there's a wealth of information, but how do we get, how do we reach them? Um, but anyways, I just want to say I really, really am excited that she is on the board and look forward to working with her. Well, thank you for those comments, Crystal. Too bad you can't see me on Zoom because I'm grinning from ear to ear. There are no happy accidents on this committee. Uh, we are very blessed that Dr. Tyler uh, Garner is willing to uh, 
cram us into her busy schedule, but uh, she is going to be a, an incredible resource to help us not just talk about it and not just meet about it, but actually do something about it. So thank you for those great comments. Anybody else? All right, before moving on, the chair kindly requests that any member of the executive committee who arrived late after roll call was taken to please identify themselves at this time so you're marked present. Scott Black is here. Sorry for the tardiness. Jerry Thank Mann. you, Scott. Thank you, Jerry. Chair, Chair Anderson. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, pardon the interruption, but just for the record, so everyone will know, we're working on a system to make sure everybody gets a calendar invite while not violating the open meeting law. So I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of the fact that we are working on that and we'll either work with you directly or your administrative assistance as we move on that. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, Ken. All right, so moving on to agenda item number 11, members of the public are invited for final comments. Katie, can you see if there's anybody on telephone or Zoom? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I don't see anybody. Thank you very much. Hearing no further comments, I hereby move to adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for coming today and appreciate your hard work. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, everyone.